We moved on and reached a point perhaps a mile and a half from the Po. A clearing showed another run, and we were just starting up an eminence in the woods when suddenly the familiar wish-wish and zip-zip informed us we had at last stirred up our nest of hornets. We immediately put ourselves in position to engage them. It didn't take long for us to find out that we were working at a decided disadvantage, both as to position and numbers. They were well supported and had entrenchments. While we were out on open ground and far in advance of any of our army, our right flank in the air, and our left the devil knew where. Briscoe now urged us on, but we refused to move another step in that direction. He grew livid with rage and swore several shocking oaths in quick succession, but this didn't move us a hair. The bullets became more and more plentiful as we stood behind the trees, trying to make up our minds what to do. To go farther was to invite annihilation of our entire force. To advance was folly, to retreat promised death or wounds at best. Briscoe swore, threatened, entreated. It was no go. He then tried to bully us by drawing his sword and threatening to cut our damned heads off. But we didn't budge. We firmly refused to sign our death warrants, or be driven or bullied any further by him or any other drunken pimp. Just at this moment, as he was trying to get us to advance again, a bullet struck his horse, nearly unseating him. He kept to the road all this time and would have been brought down but for the fact that the enemy could hear him giving orders to us to go forward, and no doubt they thought we should soon all be their game. Seeing now that they were not likely to accomplish this purpose, they turned on him and peppered his poor old nag. Briscoe wheeled about and put the spurs to what was left of the animal. With surprising agility and brilliancy of execution, he made tracks for the rear, yelling as he departed, You must all now look out for yourselves and, if anyone gets out, he might have a chance to make coffee. What an incentive to action, the privilege of making coffee. Major Briscoe is one of the last whom I would have thought capable of such a cowardly and unfeeling act. Had I not been an eyewitness and participant, it would be incredible. No thanks to him that we were not shot or gobbled and sent to Richmond to enjoy a spell at Libby Prison or Bell Island. Thought of the terrors of these dens proved sufficiently stimulating to make us attempt an escape and to succeed. We moved over the ground in a manner calculated to astonish our southern friends. The Rebs pursued us with all the speed attainable, but we, having so much more at stake, almost flew. Also, we had the promise of Briscoe's coffee to spur us on and we did outrun Johnny Reb, and did come first to the river. A goodly portion of our flight was through a section of underbrush so dense a rabbit couldn't have skinnied through without leaving behind most of his hair. By dint of a great deal of puffing, sweating, and blowing, we worked out of the thicket. The Rebs in the meantime had projected themselves through the gap between us and the fourth main and seized the road and the crossing. Seeing this, we made no attempt to reach the crossing, but jumped into the stream and made our way across. It may be said that all this scrabble caused us to indulge in sundry unscriptural remarks concerning the rebels in general, and Briscoe in particular. We jumped into the taw with a strong suspicion that we should sink to rise no more, the water being of that peculiar color that prevents one from seeing the bottom. If we could swim with our duds on, it was well. Otherwise we would drown. The shots of the rebels grew nearer and nearer and we couldn't stop to deliberate. So in we went, but instead of disappearing beneath the river, we found ourselves standing on the bottom with water only up to our waists. Such a sudden halt was too much, it nearly upset my equilibrium. I was affected very much like the cow who was struck by a locomotive and thrown into a field nearby. She wasn't hurt, but she was much surprised. I had on long-legged boots, which soon filled with water. I had to stop and turn it out thereby exposing my corporeal substance to considerable risk. But no catastrophe came to pass, and I was soon out of the way. We floundered out on the other side, and when Johnny Reb saw we had eluded him, he grew red in the face and commenced to pepper us, even firing at a lot of our wounded who were being brought across. This chivalrous conduct on the part of our southern gentlemen is unbelievable. They call us vulgar Yankees, yet I never knew a Yankee so vulgar as to fire on wounded men who were being carried from the field. Captain Richards and the fifty men posted at the bridge fell back and joined us, after doing their best to hold the crossing till we could get over. After catching our breath, we moved up and bivouacked in the same place as last night. Barlow's division were the only troops in sight, 
and we were ordered to conform to their movements. Barlow was acting as a decoy to draw the Rebs out so our men could pay them back for our little excursion. We stayed with Barlow's division until it crossed the Po, then decided to find our own and do our fighting with them. The rebels were allowed to approach so near us on the other side of the river that we could hear the orders of their officers. As we came over the Po, we received a murderous discharge of canister and spherical case. A fellow in front of me had the flesh torn from his back, as one would strip a salt fish. The enemy seemed to entertain the conceit that they were coming right over the Po as they had the Ta, but they found themselves confronted by a wall of bristling steel and a volley of musketry. They made the most determined efforts to get over, and our men were equally determined that they wouldn't. The fight soon became exceedingly hot and extended down the line. There was a continual roar, like the voice of many waters, the crash of artillery, the yells and cheers of the combatants, the groans and cries of the wounded, and the general confusion of charging and countercharging. This continued throughout the day. I regard this as one of the hardest days of fighting this army has ever seen. There was no cessation from the time action commenced till darkness mercifully closed this day of slaughter. It seems as if all rebeldom concentrated here with the sole purpose of crushing us. How could General Lee, with the meager forces said to be under him, have held and punished an army three times his size? Where was Grant? Where was Meade? Have they no strategy, no plans? If the enemy's loss was as severe as ours, they must be nearly annihilated. Preparations were made to fall back to Fredericksburg. The road was widened, and other things done to meet an emergency. A number left in the ambulances, which traveled hour after hour, all through the night, in a continual string. Those of us who had been engaged in the affair of the morning became separated from the rest of the division, and the surgeon ordered us to the hospital in the rear, saying, You boys have done enough for one day. But we desired to find our regiment, and didn't want any part of a hospital as long as we could avoid it. The sights and sounds there were too much for any except the strongest nerves. We were finally compelled to give up the search and take a rest. I, for one, hadn't life enough left in me for any further exertion, and I sank down to pass the rest of the day in a little strip of timber close by the Fredericksburg Pike. The great dark woods are filled with dead and wounded from both sides. Blue and gray sink side by side in its gloomy thickets and slimy pools. Neither side appears to have gained much from this struggle in the wilderness. 